Ignition sequence start. Five. Everything. Three. Everything. Sounds. Sounds. This is Everything Sounds. I'm Craig Shank. And I'm George Drake Jr. This is Everything Sounds. All right, we have a story, but neither of us are fluent with the nuances of French, and we'd rather not butcher the name of the main person involved in this story, so we're going to put it up to Google Translate, and hopefully it's right. Edouard Léon Scott de Martinville. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe it would have been better just to try it ourselves. So, for your reference, our American pronunciation is Edouard Léon Scott de Martinville. That's pretty good. Yeah, it's okay. But... From here on out, just to spare us any more confusion, we'll just refer to him as Scott. So, Scott was a bookseller and printer that lived in Paris in the 1800s. Now, as a printer, he was able to do plenty of reading, naturally. He read about the latest advancements in science and technology, and eventually photography caught his interest. He wanted to take the concepts behind photography, capturing light and images, and apply those to something that would record the sounds of human speech. He essentially wanted to create a more accurate version of stenography that wouldn't have any omissions. After investigating and tinkering for three years, he was granted a patent for a new invention on March 25, 1857. He called this contraption the phonautograph. His design was influenced by the human ear, which he had learned about from reading anatomy texts while he was working. The phonautograph used a horn to funnel the sound into a diaphragm, which then moved a stylus. That stylus inscribed an image of the sound waves that were collected on paper or glass. The sound was captured, but it was basically imprisoned. He only intended for the phonograph to capture visual images of the sound, and he hadn't conceived of a mechanism to play back the sound that had been captured. No one really thought about recreating sounds until the 1870s. These sounds were locked in place until 2008, when a group of researchers decided to try to play some of the sounds Scott had recorded. They optically scanned his recordings and turned the scans into digital audio files using specialized computer software. With one of the recordings that was revived, the researchers had to make a few assumptions. They chose a playback speed that would have likely suited a female singer. And this is the earliest and most clearly recognizable record of the human voice from April 9, 1860. Now, in 2009, while playing back more sounds from the phonograph, the researchers heard Scott clearly identify himself in a recording and realized that they would need to go back and adjust the speed of the playback because it was actually Scott that was singing, not a woman. So, ultimately, this is what it should have sounded like. The phonograph was the first attempt to capture sound, and since then, a lot of things have changed. Recordings are now almost an essential part of our daily lives. However, recorded music seems to be what people value most when it comes to recordings. Most music is now widely available, but there's one song that's locked away, similar to how the phonograph recordings were, but in this case, it's locked away by choice. In many ways, we take recordings for granted, especially when it comes to music. But there's somebody in Brooklyn that's trying, in his own way, to restore the value of recorded music. Uh, yeah, that's complicated. So, well, I'm Alec Duffy, and I'm a theater director, primarily, and I run a brand new art center in Clinton Hill, Brooklyn, called Jack, which is actually named after my grandfather. Alec grew up acting, but when he went to college, he decided that directing was more his speed. After he moved to New York, he began producing plays with new actors. He started his own theater company called Hoi Polloi. A typical day for Alec usually involves rehearsal, working on projects with actors and collaborators, and probably some fundraising. Then there's usually an event in the evening at Jack, the art center he mentioned a minute ago. Alec's passion for music plays a large part in his interest in the theater. Most of the pieces he's involved with have a strong musical component. Outside of public performances, Alec has also written his own music. A few years ago, Alec wrote a song titled Every Day is Christmas. It's pretty nice, actually. I walk down the street and see a wintry wonderland The candles in the windows and the Salvation Army band The general gist of it is that, uh, you know, I'm eschewing the holidays because when I'm with you, 
every day is Christmas. So I don't need that holiday fervor and the, you know, the big build up to the holidays. It's, it's, it's a love song. It's a unique take on what you typically think of when it comes to holiday songs. Um, and the, the chorus is, every day is Christmas when I'm with you. It's kind of an old, it sounds kind of like a standard, basically. A jazz standard or something like that. I've got the perfect present, one not wrapped up in a bow. She lifts my spirits high when I'm feeling low. Others long for the holidays, yes indeed they do. But every day is Christmas when I'm with you. We'll get back to Every Day is Christmas in a minute, but we need to give you some background on one of Alec's favorite musicians, Sufjan Stevens. Sufjan started releasing music in the early 2000s, and you might know one of his songs, Chicago, from being featured on the soundtrack to Little Miss Sunshine. Alec found out about Sufjan Stevens when his album Michigan was reviewed on WNYC in New York. He immediately fell in love with his music. Now, coincidentally, Alec found out later that he actually worked in the same building that Sufjan did around that time. But he never ended up meeting him, since his popularity increased to the point where he didn't have to work an everyday job, but Alec had an idea to do a stage adaptation of his album. And so, after I lost my opportunity to, to meet him personally, I wrote to his his manager, I wrote to you know his record company, trying to see if they would somehow give us the rights to, to work on a stage adaptation, but never heard back. That might seem disappointing, but don't feel too bad for Alec. He'd cross paths with Sufjan again. In fact, in 2007, the great Sufjan song Xmas Exchange was launched. People were asked to write, record, and submit a Christmas song via email. The winner of the contest would give the rights of their recorded song to Sufjan and his label, and in exchange, they would receive the rights to a previously unheard Sufjan Stevens Christmas song. See, it's all coming full circle. Now you see where this is going. So I thought, you know what? I actually had a holiday song that I had written and composed like a year earlier and recorded. And I thought, it's not Sufjan's style at all. It's not going to win. You know, but you know, I have it. I might as well just submit it for fun. Two months later, Alec got a phone call from Lowell Brams, Sufjan's stepfather and co-founder of his record label. And he says, Sufjan selected your song. Congratulations. And he said, you'll be getting a CD in the mail in about a month or two of his song, kind of written in response to yours. And, and you'll have the rights to that. And sure enough, two months later, I got this packet in the mail and it included this personal letter about how much he liked my song and what he liked about it, as well as like the the, the box set of his um, holiday albums at that point, he had a previous box set to the one he just released. And then a little card with drawings on it, and, and of course the CD of the song, which I put in. And I was expecting the song to be kind of a, not, a throw off, you know, because I was like, oh, he had, he had to write a song for this contest winner, and he's got other bigger fish to fry. But it was, I found it beautiful, and I thought ranked among some of his best songs. Um, and so then came the process of trying to figure out what to do with the song. Alec initially thought he'd just put the song up on the internet. In fact, almost immediately he was contacted by Sufjan Stevens' fan sites and blogs. They wanted the song to share with their readers. But then Alec talked to his friend Dave Malloy about the song and the contest. We were just expressing how how special this song contest was and how special it was to have won this song and and to just and to try to find an equally special way of sharing it with the world instead of it just going on the internet and and just becoming one of a million songs on people's iPods that we felt like we had to frame it in a in a particularly special way as they talked, they decided that they could intentionally make the song as rare as some songs used to be. Now, keep in mind that recorded music is still a relatively recent technological advance in human history. And even a few decades ago, until the last few years, people still had to hunt for some recordings that were either limited releases, imported, or just no longer in print. Alec and Dave shared their stories about tracking down old Prince B-sides or rare Beatles reissues. They wanted to recreate that feeling of finding music that was unique, special, and rare. 
so we decided to hold these listening sessions where people were invited to come over our our house or people could just request to come over our, our most cases my apartment and listen to the song and they would basically get two chances to listen to it while they're there we serve them tea and cookies because we just felt like it it uh, fit with the nature of the song kind of create a warm atmosphere we talk a little bit about people's history with Sufyan with listening to Sufyan uh, we invite four people at a time so we get to know each other and then we eat some cookies and drink tea and then headphones go on everyone and everyone listens to the song once and then we get some thoughts people's reactions and then they they're given the chance to listen to it a second time we talk about it some more and then the session is over some people have traveled from Baltimore and other areas relatively close to New York City to hear the song, but Alec understands that some people simply can't make the trip. So whenever Alec and Dave travel, they bring the song with them. And when we're in another city, we kind of hunt out people who have emailed us from those cities and, and have set up listening sessions in those cities. They've arranged listening sessions internationally as well. One experience in Poland stood out when Dave was traveling. He was on a train going through Poland, and someone came into his train car with a Sufjan Stevens t-shirt on. And so he offered that, uh, that guy a, a private listening session on the train. They even tried to recreate their listening session concept in Finland. We were contacted by the biggest, what was self-proclaimed biggest Sufjan Stevens fan in Finland. And we actually happened to be there for a, a theater collaboration. And so we met on the steps of the main cathedral in Helsinki and uh, put headphones on him and uh, we had cookies <laughs> and tea, but, uh, but he heard the song there. One of the most memorable sessions for Alec involved a couple that was expecting a child. The woman was eight months pregnant at the time and they listened to the song when it was played the first time and then she put the headphones on her stomach for the second time. Alec later held a Christmas party at his apartment for people that had heard the song. And so she and her husband returned with their baby now. And so their baby got a second opportunity to hear the song. It was fun. Despite Alec's best efforts to host listening parties in his home and around the world, some people still don't agree with what he's decided to do with the song. He acknowledges that it's likely frustrating for some Sufjan Stevens fans that can't travel to New York or don't live in cities where he's likely to travel to. However, Alec doesn't think of it as being that different from other events that we can't take part in at some point. Any way you frame an event, there's going to be people who are who get a chance to experience it and other people that don't. Just like I couldn't see the uh, you know a, a special art event because it cost fifty five dollars and I don't have fifty five dollars or something or because something is going on in Chicago that I'm frustrated that I can't see, but it also lends a specialness to that as well that that thing happened and I didn't get to see it and isn't that a shame? Luckily for Sufjan fans, Alec plans to continue hosting these parties indefinitely unless of course he hears objections from one person in particular. I think if Sufjan Stevens himself somehow had an objection to the the concept, then you know maybe that would force a change of of heart or ch you know a change of of what we're doing. But in fact, we actually met him after a concert that he did in New York a couple years ago, and he hadn't really he hadn't heard of of what we were doing apparently, and I explained it to him, and he seemed. He was surprised that people would actually make this pilgrimage to come hear the song. It, it kind of shocked him. But what will happen if Alec can't host the listening sessions himself? Well, he's given us some thought, and he isn't entirely sure. I mean, is it something that you pass down? I, I, I don't know if I'm going to have children or not, but will it be something like the family jewelry or something like that that will get passed down and... Or will it be, uh, you know, upon my passing, released out into the world? I haven't, I haven't really figured that out yet. For the time being, all it takes to hear the song is a little bit of sleuthing and being in the right place when Alex sets up a session. Fortunately for me, I was in the right place. I was in his apartment, but I wasn't sure if I actually wanted to hear the song. I thought it might ruin the mystique. 
but eventually I decided that I'd listen once and forego the second listening, and Alec agreed to let me keep on the recorder as long as it wasn't near the headphones. Then we talked about why they only use headphones for these sessions. Yeah, it started as for two reasons. One, because, I don't know, for some reason, both Dave Malloy and I uh, feel like when we want to listen to something special, mm-hmm. we use headphones. Right. Um, and two, because it avoided the risk of people recording it, mm-hmm. like while it was playing. Secretly, Secretly yeah. Secretly, right. <laughs> so, for those two reasons. Then he made sure everything sounded okay before I heard the song. Okay, I'm going to do a sound check on another song. Okay. For you, just to tell me how the volume is. Yeah. That's okay? That's great. That's okay? Okay. Okay, you ready? Think so. I'm going to step outside. I'm going to just let you, let you have your private moment. All right. We obviously don't have the song for you to hear, but this is how Alec describes it. It's a pretty plaintive song. It's uh, called The Lonely Man of Winter. He kind of paints a picture of childhood, uh, driving through snow-banked streets and with the, you know, in the back seat of the car, uh, being with friends during the holidays. But, uh, and there's some really obscure lines, which we haven't figured out what he means. And they must be personal references. Um, there's a reference to Hoppington's hat which we've Googled and can't find anything, so it must have just been some friend of his in his hat or something like that. Um, But it's very very much a personal, um, somewhat uh, uh, mournful song. And if I personally had to pick another Sufjan song to compare it to, based on what I can remember, it would probably be Casimir Pulaski Day, if it were shorter and with less banjo and more piano. Golden rod and the 4-H dome Things I brought you when I found out you had cancer off the bone. But after the last notes of the song, this was my immediate reaction. That was gorgeous. <laughs> that was really cool. Cool. Yeah. Wow. You know, and that seems to be what Alec is going for. Thanks to the internet, everyone can access just about any song they'd like anywhere at any time. However, arranging these listening sessions helps this particular song have the kind of impact on people like it did on Craig. When you know that you're not going to experience something again in your lifetime, no matter how small the event may be, if you start to think about it in those terms, it immediately feels different to you. That's what drives Alec in his work with these listening parties. As a theater director, I'm I'm constantly engaged in trying to create an experience for an audience. And so it's kind of natural that given the song, I wanted to create an event which brought people together and created something special which they would never forget. And certainly that's been the response to the people who have come here and experienced the song. It's something that they're never going to forget. And that's, although it, it, is, a, it is a certain small audience that we're reaching, um, that feels better to me than, uh, than just having this song be a part of a million people's iPods. You can find links for Alex Production Company, Hoi Polloi, and the Jack Art Center at our website, everythingsounds.org. We love producing this show, and we hope that you love listening to it. We're an independent production, and so far we're funding everything on our own without outside assistance. All of our bus tickets, flights, parking fees, gas, everything, it all comes only from what we are able to put into the show. You can help us cover some of those costs and expand the places we can go and stories we can cover consider becoming an Everything Sounds audiophile. You can contribute on a one-time or monthly basis, and you'll get access to bonus material as it becomes available. Learn more at everythingsounds.org support. And a special thanks to firstsounds.org for the phonograph recordings we used in the first part of our show. Thanks for listening to Everything Sounds. Until next time, I'm Craig Shank. And I'm George Drake Jr. This has been Everything Sounds. Find out more about the podcast at everythingsounds.org. Connect with Everything Sounds on Facebook and also on Twitter.